So before we start talking about infinite sets, it would, it would be a good idea to have a, a definition or to know exactly what we mean by that. Well, a finite set is one that has a one-to-one -one correspondence with this set here, right, with a set of numbers 1, 2, 3, and up to some fixed upper bound n, where that n has to be, uh, I say an integer, obviously a positive integer. And a set is infinite then if it isn't finite. Right? So an infinite set is one where we cannot come up with a one-to-one -one correspondence with some set of positive integers that has an upper bound. Okay, so let, let's see if we can start to pin this down then. Exactly how big, if you will, is an infinite set? Well, an infinite set that has the cardinality of the positive integers is what we call countable, right? So what I'm saying, if I can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between my set and the unbounded set, of positive integers, then we're going to call it countable. And there's a special symbol to represent that size. And this is something you, you may not have seen before. Uh, math, we love Greek letters, right? But, but for this one, uh, we're actually going to go to the Hebrew alphabet. And the symbol that we use for the size of a countable set is this thing here. And that letter is, it's called, the, it's called Aleph. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the way I would read this is Aleph null. So that would be the size of a countable set. So, so I've got a statement here. And it, it's a pretty bold statement, at least at first glance. What I'm saying is... The set of all integers is countable, right? But what does that mean? Well, that means that I can create a one-to-one -one correspondence between the integers and the natural numbers. Remember, uh, the, the, the basic idea here is, is if I can create this correspondence, in some sense, the sets have the same size. Well, really, let's take a look at this visually here for a second. The natural numbers are these numbers here, 0, 1, 2, and up. The integers are all of these numbers plus the negatives. All right, so just at, at first glance, give or take 0, the integers are have twice as many numbers in them as the natural numbers. I mean, you can be forgiven for looking at this and saying, no, they're not the same size. But yeah, it turns out, uh, yeah, they are, because we can create this correspondence. And so this is how we do it. Right, I'm going to define f of n to be a function from the natural numbers to the integers. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to say let f of n equal n divided by 2 if n is even and negative n plus 1 divided by 2 if n is odd. All right, so right, right off the bat, I want you to notice some things about, about what this is saying. If n is even, then we're only getting out non-negative numbers. 0 is even, so we'll get, we'll get even from that one. All right? And if n is odd... then we're only getting negative numbers. So uh, hopefully you're starting to see, right, how, how I'm going to get every integer out of this by the time we're done, right? The uh, positive integers are going to come from this top part, and the negative integers are going to come from this bottom part. All right, so to, to prove this, I need to show uh, that my function here is both one-to-one -one and onto, that, that it is a one-to-one -one correspondence. All right, so let's see how we can do that. One, two, one. We'll do that part first. And we're going to look at two cases, right? Uh, excuse me, three cases. First, suppose I pick two even numbers. And then let, let's look at their functional values. f of x, one, 
and f of x2. And you remember how we did these one-to-one -one proofs, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to assume they have equal functional values, y values, if you will. Uh, but if that's true, then that means x1 over 2 equals x2 over 2, using the even part of the formula there. But this means that the two numbers are equal. All right, so now, now let's do it again, right? Let's do it x1 and x2 are both odd. All right, well, then again, let's look at f of x1 and f of x2. That would be negative x1 plus 1 over 2 equals negative x2 plus 1 over 2. And you do your algebra thing, multiply both sides by 2, divide by negative 1, and so forth. You end up with, again, the two x values have to be the same. All right, so how, how about the mixed case? x1 even and x2 odd. Okay, well, in this case, uh, f of x1 cannot equal x2. It's not possible. Right? f of x1 is not equal to f of x2 because, as I pointed out up here, Right, f of x1 is going to be even, and f of x2 is going to be odd. Right, so I, I know that these numbers are, in fact, going to different places. All right, so that's one to one. How about on to? How can I show that? Well, again, we're, we're going to look at two cases here. Right, suppose y1 is less than zero then if i let x1 equal negative 2 y1 minus 1 okay first just to be clear uh, this is a natural number if you put a negative number in here for y1 this part becomes positive and the smallest value it can have is 2, right, because the smallest value y1 can have is negative 1. Then when, you add, then when you subtract 1 from it, it's still positive. That's going to be a natural number. All right, so what is the function value? f of x1 is equal to, got to be really careful here, keep track of our negative signs, negative, negative 2y1 minus 1 over 2. Oh, well, sorry, left off something. Uh, forgot this plus one here, plus one, and if you simplify that right-hand side, this is y1. So we're covered for the negative numbers, right? Every negative number has uh, a value from the domain that gets mapped to it. Now, how about the other way around? Suppose, uh, and let's use another letter here. Let's say y2 is greater than or equal to zero. Then I'm going to pick x2 equals twice y2 and then f of x2 is equal to 2y2 divided by 2 clearly this this is an even number right 2y2 so that's the formula that i use there and this is equal to y2 so there you go right every uh every integer has a natural number that gets mapped to it by my function. So my function is both one to one and onto, and that's what we needed to show, right? Again, we've talked about some of these before. This was a constructive proof. Uh, I literally constructed the function that I needed to make this happen. Okay, if that seems weird, <laughs> uh, you can certainly be forgiven for thinking so. A, a lot of the early work in and Seth there, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about in this lecture and the next one was done by a mathematician named George Cantor at the beginning of, of the 20th century, end of the 19th century. Uh, and there, there's a famous quote from Cantor. Cantor himself said, I can see it, but I don't believe it. Right? So if some of these things seem very odd and counterintuitive to you, um, you aren't the only one. So, um, yeah, let's make it worse. So now I'm going even further uh, down that rabbit hole. Now, not only am I saying that the integers and the natural numbers are the same size, in a sense, I'm saying that the rational numbers, positive rational numbers, 
and the natural numbers have the same size. So think about what think about what this is looking like. Draw, draw our number line here again, right? If we look at zero and one, there are infinitely many natural numbers just in that little subset alone, and there's infinitely many of those subsets. Doesn't matter. Still, they have this, the exact same size using our correspondence definition as the natural numbers. Okay, so how do we show this very strange result? Well, I, I've, I've put all of the rational numbers into this array here, right? And the way I've done this is I put all the unit fractions in the first row. It's 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and so on. Then I just repeated that, but with 2 in the numerator. Then 3, and then 4, and so on. Okay, so here's, here's how I'm going to set up my function, right? My... my one-to-one -one correspondence. I'm going to start at 1 over 1. I'm going to start at 1. I'm going to go over and then down along the diagonal. All right. When I get to the end here, I'm going to go down. And I'm going to follow this up again. When I get to the top, I'm going to go over. Then I'm going to go down along this diagonal. And again, when I, when I get to an edge, if it's a left-hand edge, I go down, then follow the diagonal. And if it's a right-hand edge, I go over. All right, so this is how I'm going to define my function sequentially. All right, so for example, uh, f of 1 is 1, f of 2 is 1 half, f of 3 is... 2 over 1, right, and, and so on. And we are going to skip some. I'm going to skip 2 over 2 because that's equal to 1, and I already put that on my list. So I'm also, I would also skip 3 over 3 and 4 over 4. And, and I'm going to skip 2 fourths because one half is already on my list, right? So any any time you get something that, that has the same value as something that you've already included because it can be reduced, just don't add it, right? Don't put it into the don't put it into the function. So the first thing I want you to notice uh, is that this function is onto because I was very methodical about the way I laid out my grid. Every rational number appears on this list. So if you follow this very methodical walking process, you will eventually get to every rational number. And since we skipped any number that duplicated a value that was already defined by the function, we also know that it isn't possible for two different input values to go to two different output values because all of the output values uh, we guaranteed that they're unique all right so that's what we needed to show my admittedly somewhat strangely defined function uh, is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the positive rational numbers and the natural numbers so these two sets have the same cardinality. They, their cardinality, the cardinality of both of them, to use our new language, the cardinality of both of them is Aleph Null. So what we did there has a name. That proof uh, actually goes all the way back to Cantor himself, right, when he first started thinking about these things. Uh, it, it's called Cantor's diagonalization argument, right, for kind of obvious reasons. It's based on zooming around on the diagonals of that little table. So that's countable sets, right? Well, the next question that, you know, that the mathematicians naturally kind of come to is, well, okay, are there infinite sets that aren't countable? Are there infinite sets that we can't create this one-to-one -one correspondence that, again, in, in some sense, are bigger than these Aleph 1 sets? And turns out the answer to that is yes, and that's what we're going to look at in the next lecture.